All right, well, thank you so much and good evening, everybody, for uh, joining us this evening. This is the last part of our educational series, Breaking Diagnostic Barriers, and it is a true pleasure for me to have one of my dear friends, Dr. John Gellies, to close out this session. I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie Wu. I am the founder of Wu University. And first, I want to just say thank you so much to Glaucos for supporting this event with an unrestricted grant. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. John Gellies. Dr. John Gellies is the director of the Specialty Contact Lens Division of the Cornea and Laser Eye Institute and the CLEI Center for Keratoconus in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's an assistant clinical professor at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science, and an adjunct clinical professor at the State University of New York College of Optometry, Illinois College of Optometry, and New England College of Optometry. Dr. Gellies is a good friend of mine, and I couldn't think of anybody better to finish this series than, than John. He is not only a, a wonderful person, but uh, a dear friend of mine, and I love lecturing with him, and uh, we, we always have so much fun together. I, I cannot wait to learn uh, all about uh, this presentation. And before we kick things off, we just have a quick polling question for you guys, just so you can get to know Dr. Gellies a little bit better. So which of the following is true about Dr. Gellies? Is it that he qualified for the New York Half Marathon in November with his personal best time, one hour, 23 minutes and 40 seconds? Number two, watercolor painting is John's hobby. His fondness is for landscapes. Number three, as a senior in high school, John played Sky Masterson in the production of Guys and Dolls. Number four, John is a car enthusiast. His favorite color optics fact is that Lexus structural blue paint contains no blue pigment. Or number five, John is working on his MBA and we're gonna find out what, uh, what everybody said. Okay, so it looks like most people think that John qualified for the New York City Half Marathon and I will leave it to Dr. Gillies. <laughs> <laughs> to take over and answer this question and take it away. Oh my, that is awesome, So Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I am not a runner. My uh, my diet consists of donuts and uh, and uh, hamburgers, so uh, there would be no uh, no marathons for me. But the true one on there is that uh, Lexus's paint color, structural blue, actually contains no blue pigment to it. It's actually a very interesting. Uh, layering that they did it took 15 years to develop. Essentially, what they did was they uh, layer zinc oxide and uh, aluminum in various different laminates, grind that all up, and the way that the light interacts with that creates a blue uh, effect. Now, this is actually stolen from the American Morpho uh, butterfly, which is uh, just a cool little uh, nerd fact. I love cars and uh, everything about them. So, Thank you so much for having me, Steph. I really appreciate it. This is just an excellent opportunity. I'm just so happy about your success with Wu University and uh, just, just thrilled to be a part of it. As we all know, Steph is just a fantastic friend. It's just an amazing colleague and this is just incredible. So tonight we're gonna go through uh, mastering advanced corneal diagnostics for the early detection of keratoconus. As you know, with these uh, you know three-part series, you've kind of gotten a little bit of everything. Tonight, what we're going to do is just show you how to do the most advanced stuff and, uh, you know, kind of talk about that and then its application. OK, so uh, a couple of disclosures here. I work with uh, Peter Hirsch, Stephen Greenstein, two of the greats in uh, cornea refractive as well as keratoconus. Uh, we work heavily in that area, publish quite a bit in that area and do a lot of research in the area. Uh, so I work with a lot of fabulous companies to uh, to perform that research. Um, so poll number one that we're going to do tonight. Um, is is this keratoconus? I'm only going to give you about 10 seconds to go ahead and answer that. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll go ahead and Urs, if you can go ahead and just uh, in the poll right now. And let's go ahead and just see those results. People better be fast on the trigger tonight. So 61% are saying yes. And indeed, 
This is keratoconus, but you need advanced diagnostic tools to diagnose this. So we'll go through this exact case and we'll show you why it's keratoconus. So tonight we got a hundred slides to go through, so we're going to burn these things up. So the background of keratoconus, as you know, it's a progressive corneal disease. It's characterized by a loss of biomechanical strength within the corneal stroma, which leads to focal thinning, steepening, and irregular topography. This can also be accompanied by tears in uh, Decimay's membrane and in even Bowman's layer. Um, and it's a bilateral, asymmetric, and clinically non-inflammatory disease. We know this from the uh, major review paper uh, that was uh, published in 1999 by Yaron uh, Rabinowitz. Um, the prevalence of this disease is ever-changing, and the reason for this change is because of advanced diagnostic equipment. When we look at originally in that Rabinowitz paper, one in 2,000 individuals were estimated to have a keratoconus, um, but that was derived from a Kennedy study in 1986 uh, based on Olmsted County data uh, around the Mayo Clinic. Um, and that was using classic uh, diagnostic tools such as retinoscopy and uh, keratometry. Whereas now we can see that the uh, prevalences are much, much higher than that. We can see that, uh, you know, one in, uh, one in 375 in a cohort study within the Netherlands, uh, one in 191 in, the, uh, in New Zealand in another cohort study, and uh, Chen reported a one in uh, 84 uh, in Australia in another cohort study. But if we look at Hashimi's uh, study that in 2000, uh, this is a worldwide incidence or excuse me prevalence um, that was uh, uh, found by looking at uh, as a, uh, a meta analysis, basically looking at multiple different uh, publications. I believe it's 29 different publications, and uh, finding a worldwide uh, prevalence of one in 725. Uh, so is the disease becoming more common or are we just having better and better diagnostic tools to find it? And the latter is more so the truth. Now, we know the associated diseases with this, Down syndrome, atopic dermatitis, sleep apnea, allergy. Um, and we know the associated risk factors with it, the two biggest one being eye rubbing and a history of uh, keratoconus. Um, but if we look at these massive uh, you know, national health care systems and nationwide health care analysis, uh, the, the main ones that are there are, uh, you know, atopic disease, allergy and asthma, uh, Down syndrome, and sleep apnea. That is our main um, uh, area that we're looking at here, our main uh, associated factors. And we know what the advanced slit lamp signs look like, um, but this is not what the, uh, you know, early diagnostics look like. We know the progressive uh, visual impact as the disease gets worse and worse. Um, but we want to be able to find this disease at its earliest point. It used to be that we couldn't uh, do anything to stop the disease. The management was to diagnose it when subjective complaints or observable findings were, were uh, apparent and then visually manage them with an RGP, but we couldn't stop the disease. And once we went to the corneal gas permeable disease, if they continued to progress, they'd either get contact lens intolerance because we couldn't get a well-fitting lens or advanced corneal scarring. And if that happened, we'd go to a penetrating keratoplasty. And keratoplasties, you know, basically they are at a rate of around 12 to 21% based on the literature that you look at. But the CLEX study group, uh, which was an optometry led uh, a study, um, fabulous study, basically what they found uh, was that if you were younger diagnosed with keratoconus, steeper K's worth its visual acuity, had corneal scarring, poor contact lens comfort, or a poorer visual related quality of life, you were more likely to have a corneal transplant. Now, all of this changes with the, uh, the cross-linking procedure. This creates a fundamental change in ectasia management because we have the ability to hop, halt progression of the disease and save vision. So now it becomes extremely important for us to diagnose the disease as early as possible prior to even visual impact get corneal collagen cross-linking to be able to stop or, or halt the disease, and then to go ahead and visually rehabilitate uh, the individual, whether by, you know, surgical procedures, uh, like uh, topography, got a PRK, intact, CTAC, or uh, specialty contact lenses, and then to monitor them often. So we're creating this kind of cycle uh, looking at it. Um, and only using a corneal transplant as our last result. Now, the emphasis on this really puts us uh, in a position where we need to differentiate 
normal from early keratoconus, right? Uh, early keratoconus is clinically imperceptible on slit lamp examinations, and many of these individuals will be fully correctable with the refraction. Uh, and what we find is that, you know, in, in the Netherlands, in this published study, they found that there was a mean diagnosis of individuals with keratoconus of 28 years old which means that we are missing this at its earliest state. When we looked at this mean diagnosis, those individuals were diagnosed once their, uh, their severity of their cornea was at 55 diopters. So we're looking at this going, wow, these individuals are, are very advanced when they're getting diagnosed. So what do we do for these individuals? You know, how are we gonna find this disease earlier? Do we screen everybody and what devices do we need to use? Well, based on some polls that we've done previously and some polls that we'll do tonight, only about 40% of ODs own a topographer. Um, so what are we gonna use? How are we gonna find this? How do we lower our threshold to get these tests so that we can find these diseases early? And um, you know, what are the metrics that we're gonna use? Well, we wanna think like glaucoma in this case. Both glaucoma and keratoconus are multi multifactorial diseases. We know that IOP is extremely important, just like we know Ks are important, but we need more data for an earlier diagnosis. We need to look at structure and function. And since these are both progressive diseases, both are in need of frequent monitoring based on the risk factors that are available. And we want to treat them both with, uh, with treatments that can halt or slow the progression. In this way, I like to equate corneal collagen cross-linking to being very similar to a MIGS uh, procedure. Essentially, what we're doing is even though we have the procedure performed, that doesn't mean that we stop monitoring the individual and just say, oh, you've had it done, see you later. Uh, we need continuous monitoring of these individuals to make sure that they're not continuously progressing. So the first stab at uh, you know, multi-metric uh, diagnostics is actually with the Amsler Crumex staging. So the Amsler Crumet classification system was established in 1946. Uh, what this did was it took together about four different signs. You looked at uh, slit lamp observations, refraction, keratometry, and pachymetry, and put that all together to basically create a grading scale. Uh, now this is kind of, ha or definitely at this point, uh, you know, being that it was established in 1946, has some limitations to it because it was with old tech, right? Now with the newer diagnostics, we should be able to have a better classification system. And indeed, what we have are more actionable metrics to be able to diagnose keratoconus. So based on function, which is using uh, you know, objective metrics in the form of aberrometry, so looking at higher order aberrations, structure, looking at you know, corneal curvature and, uh, and shape factors. We also wanna look at corneal thicknesses but also corneal biomechanical strengths. Now, there is no currently accepted modern classification system for keratoconus. A lot of them have been proposed. And in fact, this uh, 2015 paper, uh, which is the global consensus on keratoconus and, ecta and ectatic disease, uh, re reached forth to try and uh, create somewhat of a classification system. Um, but this was hotly contested um, and when we look at this, you know, there were multiple different uh, letters to the editor about this. Um, basically, what it came down to was that everybody, whether you agreed to their classification system, whether you agreed to the way that they diagnosed per, or, or relied on diagnosis or diagnosing or, or monitoring for progression, everybody agrees that we must have modern devices to catch keratoconus in its earliest state. Um, now, there is a note that I'm going to put forth tonight before we really start jumping into this, which is that there are a tremendous amount of various different uh, indices, various different uh, metrics that are out there. Uh, and, you know, some of these are device specific. Some of these, uh, you know, are, are specific to a single manufacturer of a device. So we're not going to go through all of these, uh, you know, nuanced, uh, you know, device specific um, uh, metrics. What we're going to do tonight is I'm going to teach you about the metrics that are agnostic. I'm going to show you the ways that you can apply this to any map, any device in that category. So if you're looking at a topography, I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know about looking at topography.
I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know looking at uh, tomography, at aberometry, all these sorts of things so that you can apply this because there are pages and pages and pages of indices that we could go through that are all device specific. Um, so poll number two here, uh, we're going to go ahead and fire this one. I want to know, do you own a corneal topographer? And with this, we're going to go ahead, while we're waiting on that poll, for you guys to go ahead and answer that poll, I'm going to go ahead and start going through the uh, corneal topography stuff. So a corneal topographer is essentially a placido disc. So a placido disc is just evenly spaced discs, and they're reflected off of the corneal surface. And what happens from there is that the device is going to go ahead and map out the shape of each one of these rings and mathematically calculate the spacing between these rings to describe a curvature shape of the eye. Um, you can see in the individual who has a normal cornea, we have nice evenly spaced rings. You can see that they are round. Now in the individual with keratoconus, you can see that the rings are warped. This is indicating that there is an irregularity in that corneal shape. And what you can see is that the spacing in the areas that are steeper, the spacing is much smaller in the areas that are uh, kind of flatter, you can see that they're more stretched. So when we look at this area here, um, these individuals with keratoconus are going to have warped, not broken Myers. If you have broken Myers, broken Myers are an indication that there is a tear film anomaly going on and that the tear film is breaking up on the eye. Um, now, when we look at the maps, this is the color representation of the maps uh, telling us that there is irregularity present. Um, when we look at this in somebody who has a, uh, a nice homogeneous cornea or a normal cornea, we would expect this to be all green. Now, what I want to caution you about, though, is looking at scaling, right? This scale is showing us that, you know, 30 in the the you know 39 40 area is blue but up in the 50 55 area is red um, but if you can uh, red or white right but you can scale this on various different notions that would make this look much less severe or you can scale it down so that on a normal cornea you're showing a gradient between 40 and 45 so the color scale should be not one that you totally rely on. You should rely almost entirely on the keratometry values, the instantaneous curvature points across that cornea, okay? Now, when we look at these corneal points, these are keratometry values. These are instantaneous curvature. So how curved is the cornea at any individual point? Now, we're going to go over axial maps specifically because these are the most commonly used maps uh, that are out there. Essentially, the way that this is working is what we're doing is we're looking on the axial plane, the plane that we're looking at as far as uh, uh, looking into the instrument, and we're measuring the curvature at each individual court point based on that plane. So when we look at this, what we want to look at are various different keratometry metrics. The one that we're going to look at right here in the center is the mean keratometry. So what's happening average in the center of that cornea. And the mean keratometry on this eye is 45.5 uh, or 44.5 diopters. When we look at that, that's a very normal corneal uh, mean keratometry. If we were to see that, that wouldn't really raise any flags. But as you can clearly see down below that, this individual has a massively steep cornea. This uh, metric that we're measuring right here the steepest point on the cornea is called K-max. And what we're looking at here is this is the steepest or most curved portion of that cornea. Uh, what we're next looking at is we're looking at the flattest portion of the cornea compared to the steepest portion of the cornea in a six millimeter optic zone. And this is a metric known as the IS ratio. It is a measurement of asymmetry from top to bottom of the cornea. And this is one metric that you can use that's highly statistically significant 
for diagnosis of keratoconus. If we have an IS ratio of greater than 1.4 diopters, or rather greater than 1.5, essentially what we are seeing is that these individuals likely have keratoconus excuse me, keratoconus. Um, our next one that we're gonna look at is axis skew. What you can see is we're gonna go through the major meridial, uh, major meridians here. And what you can see is if we take a look at the meridian here versus the major meridian here, you can see that they're offset. They're not exactly uh, 90 degrees apart. And what we get here is there's an angle that's formed. And that angle is what we call the axis skew. If we have an axis skew of greater than 20 degrees, if we have more than a diopter and a half of corneal cylinder, this is again, a metric that we wanna use for diagnosing keratoconus, okay? Now, all these have been long established. These have been established by uh, Kleiss and Rabinowitz primarily, and these are metrics that you can use on any corneal topography map. Now, uh, let's go ahead, let's see the polling results from poll two. Excellent, so about 50%, like what we were talking about before, about 50% of individuals will own a corneal topographer. Now I'm gonna asterisk that by also saying that most individuals that are interested in listening to this, uh, this lecture tonight or any of the corneal-based lectures are mostly interested in this area and would own a corneal topography. So it'd be interesting to see on a lecture about glaucoma or a lecture about a retinal disease how many of those individuals own a corneal topographer as well. So let's get into poll number three here. We're gonna go ahead and launch this one. And this one's about corneal tomography. Do you own a corneal tomographer? So we'll go ahead, we'll let that poll run. So what is corneal tomography? Corneal tomography is very similar to taking a, a, any sort of tomography. It's just slices. Of the, uh, of the area of interest, right? So what we're doing here is we're taking slices of the cornea and we're, put, we're reconstructing that in a three-dimensional model to be able to give full corneal metrics. This will give us anterior, posterior, and thickness measurements of the, of the cornea. This is a very common structure to be delivered, uh, or rather a, a very common format of uh, delivery of tomography data. And this is what's called a, a formats refractive on this device. But what it's giving you is anterior curvature, anterior elevation, posterior elevation, and corneal thickness. Now these are all global maps. So we're not just looking at a single point of thickness or a single point of curvature. We're getting all of this metric all together. Now the curvature maps run the same metrics that we went over in the corneal topography. But there's two new metrics here, which are the elevation maps. And the elevation maps here on the back surface of the cornea and the front surface of the cornea are basically us putting a best fit sphere through the shape of the cornea. So let's get a shine plug or rather one of those slices of the cornea. What we're doing is we're putting a best fit sphere through it and we're looking at the portion of the cornea that's popping through that best fit sphere. So you can see if we put a best fit sphere in red through the front of the cornea and a best fit sphere in purple through the back of the cornea, we can see that we get these little protrusions popping through that best fit sphere uh, on the front and the back of the cornea. When we look at that, that's where these little hot spots or elevations uh, come up uh, in, these, uh, in this cornea. And what you can see is that if we have an elevation on the front surface of the cornea greater than 15 microns uh, by using a float technique or floating that best fit sphere through the cornea, that is uh, a individual with keratoconus. On the back surface of it, if we have a posterior float of greater than 20 microns, again, that is another sign of keratoconus. Our last one is looking at the corneal pachymetry and we're looking at a thinnest point value. If your thinnest point value is less than 500 microns, you should be considering this for keratoconus. The next one is now looking at corneal tomography, but in the use case of a corneal OCT. On this previous slide, we were looking at a lower resolution technology called a Scheinflug camera. Essentially what this is doing is it's giving us a, a large depth of focus so that we can collect everything here. But you can see 
that we can get an idea of where the epithelium is, we can get an idea of the thickness of the cornea, but what we can't do is look at individual, uh, you know, keratocyte resolution or anything like that. With corneal OCT, we're able to see this because it's extremely high resolution, and thus we can map the epithelium of the cornea or very specific layers of the cornea to determine the thickness of each individual layer there. So we take a look at this cornea here, you can see on the red line, we've mapped out where the stroma is. And on the yellow line, we've mapped out where the epithelium is. So that difference there, you can see that over the apex of this keratoconic cornea, we get very thin epithelium. But as we go away from it, you can see that we're getting thickening of the epithelium. This is what, if we were looking in a, a three-dimensional version of the epithelium, would be referred to as an epithelial donut. So let's take a look up here. You can see the normal cornea up here has a normal epithelial thickness, looking at that single layer. We can see that it's evenly distributed. We have about 50 microns all the way across. Whereas in the individual with keratoconus, you can see that overall in their PAC imagery map, they're thin. But if we look at their epithelial map specifically, we get a donut pattern. It's thin over the thinnest point, over the uh, apex, but we also get this band of thickening around the base, right? You can see how much thicker that epithelium is. And that's where we get the donut descriptor. Um, now, when we look at this, what we're also looking at is the variation or the variability, the max min on this epithelium, which is telling us how much of a difference is there from the thickest point of the epithelium to the thinnest point of the epithelium. And what you can see is in the normal cornea, we have about four microns of epithelium. It should be a pretty even sheet. Whereas in the keratoconic cornea, we can see that we have 19 microns of, of change uh, in that cornea. And if we look at a max min value, we're looking at anywhere around 10 microns of max min as being one of the things that you should look for in keratoconus. So let's go ahead, let's see the results of poll number three. Excellent, wow, so only about 15% of individuals own a corneal tomographer. So that's very interesting. We're gonna go on to poll number four here, which is looking at wavefront aberrometry. How many of you own a wavefront aberrometer? So as we move forward through this, we're gonna talk a little bit about wavefront aberrometry and higher order aberrations. So when we have a keratoconic cornea, what it's doing is that cornea is essentially creating variable focusing power across the corneal surface. That variable focusing power causes scattering of that light. And that creates a doubling, smearing, and higher order aberrations. Essentially, if we had a perfect optical system and we showed you a point of light on a back, black background, you'd see that specific point of light. But as we start adding in aberrations, these start smearing the light in various different patterns. Defocus, meaning myopia or hyperopia, astigmatism being astigmatism, and then we start getting into higher order aberrations that can't be corrected in glasses, such as spherical aberration, coma, or trefoil. Now, when we look at this, they can be broken down on these Zernike polynomial tables uh, to show you the lower order aberrations, which can be corrected with glasses, and the higher order aberrations, which are extremely important to the quality of vision. And you can see that those higher order aberrations are the ones that can't be corrected with glasses or soft contact lenses. When we look at this, a wavefront aberrometer works by projecting uh, light into the eye and that light then bounces off of the retina, comes back out of the eye and hits a micro lenslet array where you get those micro lenslets focusing on a sensor and you get a pattern of dots that look like this. You can see the dots on a, from a normal cornea are evenly spaced we can see that there's no real variation in the, uh, in the spacing uh, of that, uh, that grid pattern. Whereas if you go to the keratoconic individual, you can see that that grid pattern is irregular. You can see that the spacing is bunched in certain areas and stretched in other areas. And we can map these spacings out very similar to like how we map out a corneal topography. So we're mapping out what the total aberrations of the eye look like. 
uh, wavefront aberrometry by itself is uh, nonspecific. Uh, so it's not going to tell you that it is a corneal disease. It's going to tell you that there's an irregularity in the optical system. But in somebody who's young and doesn't have any sort of other ocular pathology, like a cataract or, uh, or any sort of uh, lenticonus, uh, those individuals should have a very normal optical system. And you can assume that these sorts of higher order aberrations are likely indicating a corneal issue, which should trigger you to want to get a corneal topography. But there are very specific aberrations that are present in individuals with keratoconus that should help indicate that those individuals have a, uh, a keratoconic situation. And that specifically is vertical coma. That is the predominant aberration. And essentially what coma is doing is it's giving you that tail off of, off of light. Of that streaking that individuals with keratoconus complain about. Now, when we look at higher order aberrations specifically, so the total amount of aberrations, a normal eye should have less than 0.4 microns of higher order aberrations. Once we get into the individuals who are suspicious for keratoconus, those individuals are kind of from the 0.4 to the 0.8 region of uh, microns of aberrations of root mean square. Uh, if they're greater than 0.8, those individuals most likely have keratoconus at that point. Um, so when we look at the various different, uh, you know, studies that are out there, uh, Lim's paper here looked at showing that there was a statistically significant difference in the amount of higher order aberrations present in individuals with keratoconus, specifically uh, looking at uh, at uh, total higher order aberrations and third order aberrations such as coma and trefoil. Um, when we look at uh, Kosaki, uh, his work looks specifically at the total higher order aberrations being higher in individuals with keratoconus, but most importantly, the two that were most predominantly found is coma and trefoil. Those are the big ones that you should be looking at. So total amount of higher order aberrations, trefoil, and coma. Now, if we look at other factors, if we combined aberrations with uh, 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 corneal topography, we can determine that this is going to be a very, very strong uh, indicator of having keratoconus. So this can be put together as being a very strong factor uh, uh, for the diagnosis in early uh, keratoconus. Uh, now we'll go ahead, we'll look at the results of Paul 4. Uh, very few of us own uh, wavefront aberrometers. Um, we'll go ahead, we'll launch Paul 5, which is corneal biomechanics. Do you own a device capable of doing corneal biomechanics? Uh, things like the, uh, the ORA, the uh, ocular response analyzer. Um, so let's jump into this. So a ocular response analyzer is essentially looking, it's basically a non-contact tonometer. What you're getting is a, uh, a jet of air that's hitting the cornea. It's depressing the cornea to get to its amplination point. And what we have is on either, size, a, uh, either side of this, uh, a IR emitter and a detector for that IR. So when we start the amplination, you can see that the cornea rapidly flattens. And once it hits its, uh, its first amplination moment where it makes a perfectly flat surface, the peak signal is created because the IR is reflected off of that surface and picked up by that detection uh, a detector off to the side. So what we get is a peak that's formed. As the amplification continues, you can see that our cornea continues its inward ca uh, concavity, and thus the signal is lost. We start to lose that. As the pressure dissipates and the air jet is completing, the cornea then rebounds, it outgoes, and it starts to come back out from its most concave position. And as it comes back out, it'll hit another corneal plane. Once it hits that second amplination moment, you get a second peak. And then the cornea comes back into its natural position, and that's where the peak ends. When we look at this, there are two main factors that come out of this, which is corneal resistance factor, 
which is the ability of the cornea to rebound, and then corneal hysteresis, which is the elasticity of the cornea. Now, in individuals with obvious cases of keratoconus, it's obvious that their corneal resistance and their corneal uh, hysteresis are, um, are reduced. However, the metrics that come out of this are not very sensitive or specific for differentiating subclinical disease from normal uh, corneas. Now, if we look at a series of different, uh, different studies out there, um, it's easy for us to tell the differences between you know, an individual who has a normal cornea and an individual who has frank keratoconus and an individual who is post-LASIK, but it's very difficult for us to use these devices uh, to tell the difference between an individual who has keratoconus and those who, who have undergone uh, corneal collagen cross-linking. But if we apply uh, various metrics that are derived uh, by analyzing these sorts of curves, we can find statistically significant custom metrics to be able to tease out those little variations. So it's not that the device is incapable of finding those, those very small minute changes. It's that the output metrics that they put out, the corneal resistance factor and the hysteresis are not specific enough to describe those sorts of changes. So if the companies were to decide to go back to the, the device and incorporate these little custom metrics, you could very easily use this to differentiate normal from early keratoconus. Um, and in fact, they use these to uh, differentiate the difference between uh, keratoconus, or excuse me, uh, pre and post cross-linking corneas and show that there is a statistically significant difference uh, in the stiffness of these corneas. Um, so let's go ahead, let's see the results there. Almost nobody has a corneal biomechanics device. Very interesting. Uh, when we get into uh, portion six, we're gonna start talking about artificial intelligence. So I wanna know, are you excited or are you afraid of using artificial, intel artificial intelligence uh, in eye care? So let's go ahead and go into this. So, you know, what we found is that there's multiple different metrics. So we've talked about corneal topography, corneal tomography. We've talked about wafer aberrometry. In topography, it's been long known that we can kind of combine multiple different metrics together to be able to create these uh, multifactorial indexes, right? So one of them that was very popular is the KISA. This is done by Rabinowitz. Essentially what this is looking at is the overall K value, the IS ratio, and the, uh, the axis skew. And we put those all together to create a individual metric that we can quantify. And this becomes highly statistically significant for stating that there is keratoconus, right? because we're putting multiple metrics together to diagnose keratoconus at its earliest state, right? So just like we said before, with glaucoma, we're going to put together visual fields, IOP, uh, you know, uh, uh, nerve fiber layer thickness, uh, all these things together to be able to come up with an index to say, oh, this individual has, uh, excuse me, has glaucoma at an early state. We're putting together all these various different indexes that we talked about today uh, together to be able to say, hey, this individual has keratoconus, right? So this was the early one. This was for topography. So we're using just topography and the metrics off of that to come together to say, hey, this individual may have keratoconus. Well, when we add in tomography, we can go ahead and start adding in various different metrics. And we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit, but where we look at not only curvature factors, but now we can look at elevation factors of the front and the back surface of the cornea. We can look at global pachymetry factors. All of those can be brought together to make it more highly statistically sensitive and specific. So if we take a look at these uh, metrics here in this uh, Shetty paper, essentially what you're seeing is rock curves being uh, uh, presented. And you can see that this is highly uh, sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of keratoconus uh, in those individuals if we use these multi-metric uh, models. Now, there is a uh, artificial intelligence called logic that's been developed 
uh, and this was based on the red cake study. Basically what this is, is logic is a, uh, a agnostic uh, analyst of uh, tomography. So this can take in uh, any tomography and analyze it and look at the thickness and the elevations and the curvature factors uh, to help diagnose keratoconus at its earliest point. Um, the next one, but this is all based off of just tomography. Now, what about if we combine devices? We learned about biomechanics and we learned about tomography tonight, but if we smash those two together, we now can get something called the uh, tomographic biomechanical index, right? And if we look at that, that is really putting everything together, the weakness of the cornea with the structure of the cornea. And now we really have something that can really be highly statistically sensitive and specific. But then we can go into future algorithms, which will put in you know, the tomography, the biomechanics and the aberrometry to give a total ocular objective analysis. And this is really gonna be the holy grail, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about the data aggregation, right? So if we look at this, Right. What we're looking at is the, uh, the elevation maps. And what this can do is we look at the elevation of the front surface of the cornea, for instance, and we look at the classic elevation map. And what that's doing is that's looking at the elevation uh, by floating a best fit sphere through there. Well, what we do next is we go ahead and we eliminate the area around the thinnest point, three millimeters around the thinnest point, so that we're lining up with the peripheral cornea. And then we look at the elevation that comes through there. And you can see that that elevation is exaggerated. It makes it easier to see the elevated portion of the cornea, right? So by doing this, we can more easily uh, detect uh, keratoconus, right? So if we had a normal cornea and we cut out the, th the thinnest three uh, millimeters, it's gonna be exactly the same. There's no difference in that corneal curvature. The best fit sphere basically continues to fit but as we start to have ectasia, we get this more uh, protruded area. Now, if we take a look at thickness and we took a look at just half of the cornea and we looked at the cornea and how it thickens over the, uh, the, the uh, meridian of the cornea, we can see that the cornea gets thicker at a differentiating rate. And then we can put this on the, uh, the thickness increase um, graphs down here to say that is this within a normative database or does it fall outside of a normative database? Is it thickening at an abnormal rate or at a normal rate? And is that thickness uh, a normal amount of thickness? So we can combine that data together and this is what we get in the Bell and Ambrosio uh, ectasia display, enhanced ectasia display. And what this is doing is this is giving us a early indication that there is something abnormal with this cornea. You can see on this cornea, the front surface is very normal, but the posterior surface is abnormal. And we can see that there's a very small abnormality to the way that this cornea thickens over time. If we look at this uh, with uh, a, a cornea that is um, uh, more advanced, you can see that that D value, that indexing value goes up. And if we go to a normal cornea, you can see that that D value goes down. And then we can get to kind of these more suspicious corneas uh, where it's around four. The cutoff value is kind of around two. That's kind of where we want to look at, okay? And if we look at this, this is highly statistically significant uh, for the diagnosis of keratoconus. Now we can also use this in classification. So if we look at the anterior corneal curvature, the posterior corneal curvature and the corneal thickness, um, we're gonna ignore the D value in this because this takes into account the distance visual acuity. But what this is doing is this is looking at uh, staging the cornea based on the thinnest points by putting together you know, multiple different metrics. So let's put this together. You can see on this individual, they have a high level of uh, on their ABCD. You can see that their, uh, their factors here are coming up very high on this grid scoring. And you can see if we get somebody who's a little bit less, we can see again, still we're getting higher factors on that scoring. But if we go to somebody who's generally normal, you can see that our scoring is very low here. Um, but this is still very questionable because they have some elevation on the back surface. Now you can use this in progression analysis. So if we have an individual who started at this baseline in the yellow 
and we saw that they progressed like they do in the green, you can see that this individual is clearly progressing over time. And this is looking at multiple different factors, right? And we can look at how you would use this in, uh, in, in uh, you know, treatment over time. So on that black dotted line, uh, what we did was we marked off where we gave this individual uh, corneal collagen cross-linking. And you can see as after that line there, the blue and the red bars there are showing that the individual is stable over time. So this is how we can use these multi-metric factors uh, with time. So let's go ahead. We're going to look at, uh, wow, so a lot of people are excited about AI and eye care. This is fantastic. So let's go ahead, let's move on to uh, number seven. And this is where we get into corneal genetics, okay? So corneal genetic testing, um, we wanna go ahead and uh, talk about this a little bit more because this is an evolving area. We know that corneal, you know, keratoconus is a complex disease. We know that it does have a genetic component to it and that there are multiple different linkage studies out there uh, that look at chromosomal uh, uh, low size. And there's been a lot, uh, most recently, a study that's identified about 36 uh, genetic loci. So when we look at this, um, there's been a test developed uh, that is there to assess objectively the risk of, uh, of having keratoconus uh, by looking at these multiple genetic risk factors. Keratoconus is what we call a polygenetic disease, meaning that there are multiple genes that are associated with the disease. It's not a Mendelian disease uh, or a monogenic disease where you have one, uh, one gene and that results in the disease. Um, so let's go ahead and go through this. So when do you order genetic testing for these individuals? Well, you order it when you have questionable findings. So things on topography or thickness changes or, or even, you know, weird refractions that aren't making sense. It could make sense to get a uh, corneal genetic testing. You want to do this in patients who want corneal based uh, treatment options. So corneal refractive surgery, or they may have a positive history or correlated disease to keratoconus. So for this, you're going to take a buccal swab. So a cheek swab on this, uh, and then go ahead and send that into the lab. And they're going to send you back a, a, a test result page. And this is going to tell you on a spectrum whether they have a high or low risk for keratoconus. And this is looking at, again, those, uh, those genes and kind of looking at a 75 uh, gene panel uh, to tell you how many of those are being expressed in the individual. So let's take a look at this individual. Let's say that this is a primary care setting. We see this topography. The individual is 16 years old, no family history. They're a contact lens where they have a history of eczema and allergy uh, and they refract to 2020, but you see this topography. Is this concerning? It's one of those where you ask yourself, is this lens warpage? Is this dryness? Is this just plain normal and I should stop worrying? Well, we want to go ahead and look at this individual and possibly work them up further, right? So let's say our only test that was available to us was corneal topography. We get genetics as a backup to this, right? If it comes back at low risk, we go, okay, it's still slightly irregular though. Let's go ahead and follow this individual up every six months, tell them no eye rubbing, let's treat their allergy, and let's just let those typical uh, progression standards apply. But if it came back at moderate or high risk, this individual, we'd go ahead and we'd monitor them more aggressively, just like a higher risk in glaucoma. We'd see this individual back every three months for follow-up. We'd tell them no eye rubbing, uh, no, uh, you know, treat their allergies. And we would lower our threshold for referring this individual for corneal collagen cross-linking and treating them. So let's go ahead, let's talk about this case. So this individual, we assumed that they had low risk. We treated them with, you know, in their allergy, we said, hey, follow up in six months. We planned for follow up in six months after we saw that they were stable, but the patient didn't return until 15 months later in that, uh, that top right. And you can see that they are complaining that my vision is blurry, new glasses didn't help this individual progressed two and a half diopters, and we can confirm the case of keratoconus for this. So if we use the genetic test in this individual, we would know the genetic risk on this individual. We could have gotten them to believe that there's more reason for uh, follow-up and compliance with that. 
we could catch the disease early, treat it early, and save the vision. So we'll go ahead, we'll just very quickly touch on uh, future corneal diagnostics uh, because we're running out of time here. Um, but there's three main uh, you know, areas that we're coming into, which is the corneal biomechanics. So this is an area of research that's becoming very, very hot, very hot topic. And what we're using, and this one exists outside of the US, this is a shine plug based waveform. So just like we were talking about before with a non-contact uh, tonometry, this is basically that, but we're running a shine plug camera the entire time and we're taking video of the cornea and how it deforms uh, over time. And you can see on the normal cornea, you can see a very clear uh, depression and then popping back of the cornea. Whereas the keratoconic cornea, you can see it pops down, it shakes around and jostles and then very slowly recovers. So you can see that there are various different factors that are going to be involved in this, right? We can see that there's a depression factor, the time at which the cornea depresses down, how far it depresses down, how fast it recovers, all of those metrics can be followed uh, and statistically uh, and are statistically significant for diagnosing keratoconus. This, uh, this uh, image here is showing that we can compare the, directly compare these images over time and compare the various different factors of them so that we can find the differences in these corneas over time. You can actually use this to track the changes in individuals before and after corneal collagen cross-linking, but also for early detection in keratoconus. This will give you a little bit more of uh, the idea of what's happening with these corneas and what those indexes look like. And now what they can do is they can bind the multiple metrics here, just like we put together multiple metrics on shape factors, we put together multiple metrics on, uh, on uh, corneal uh, or on corneal biomechanics for this. And the more that we add in, the more statistically significant it becomes. The next one is looking at Brulian microscopy. Essentially what this is, is it's looking at optical scatter within the cornea, and this corresponds to the elastic modulus of the cornea. Uh, it's non-contact, but it only looks at microns at a time. And the reason that this is so interesting is it can be directed to very specific points of the cornea and tell you exactly what's going on in that specific tissue. So in the individual with keratoconus, if we look focally over the area of the cone, we can see that the cornea is significantly weaker in that area. And if we look in the area outside of that, we can see that the cornea is uh, more like a normal cornea. So it's a focal weakness in keratoconus. And when we look at this again, we can go ahead and use this to differentiate normal from abnormal or corneas with keratoconus uh, that were untreated and those that are treated with corneal collagen cross-linking. And we can map these out and create maps that correspond with our elevation and our thickness maps. The last one is corneal uh, elastography. And this is OCT elastography. Essentially what this is, is this is a compression uh, force where we're tracking the movement of keratocytes. So in this one, what we're using is a plane kind of like a, uh, a confocal where we're coming into contact with the cornea and we're moving that cornea a little bit and we're tracking the movement of those keratocytes and we're calculating that to give the tissue modulus and uh, we can use that for looking at effective treatment. What we find is in normal corneas, we're stiffer in the anterior portion of the cornea or the blue portion and we're weaker in the posterior cornea uh, or the red portion here. In individuals with keratoconus, they're more homogenous. They lose that anterior stromal um, uh, strength. And if we treat them with corneal collagen cross-linking, they actually create that bifurcation. They get more uh, anterior corneal strength. And um, those individuals uh, uh, display that, uh, that differentiation. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pump all the way forward to the very end here, um, which is this here. Um, we wanna to go to our summary slide, which is essentially this. Now we had a lot of information in there. There's a lot more, but it's all nerd stuff as far as uh, you know, going into the various different studies. What you need to know walking away from this lecture tonight 
is that you need to look for K values greater than 47 diopters at any portion of the cornea. You need to look at symmetry of the corneas. You need to look at is the cornea symmetrical from top to bottom and use your IS ratio to determine that. So if you're greater than 1.5 diopters, that is a lack of symmetry. You want to look at your pachymetry values, overall pachymetry. If you're less than 500 microns at any given point, you should be thinking keratoconus. If you have corneal uh, tomography available to you, you should be looking for epithelial donut patterns. Uh, if you have wavefront aberrometry for you, you should be looking at coma, trefoil, and total higher order aberrations being greater than four microns. And then you should be looking at your genetic risks. If you have high genetic risks, you should be following these individuals much, much more often. And with that, we'll go ahead and we'll wrap it up. And I'll turn this over to uh, Steph so that she can uh, keep things going. <laughs> Awesome. Well, that was amazing. I It's amazing how much information you can cram into <laughs> an hour long. And especially from all the, the different things, like the polls were so interesting to see how many people actually have these different pieces of equipment. And it, it's really cool because even though you don't have that piece of equipment, I, I think it's still so important to understand what that piece of equipment does, what the measurement is telling us, and where things can be valuable for patients. So even if you don't have it, maybe if uh, you get a report from somewhere else, it's, it's very helpful to kind of add to the patient's um, you know, history to kind of find out the whole piece of the puzzle. So thanks so much, John.